Hi, and welcome to today's webinar, Leadership and Competition, Striking the Right Balance. I'm Ryan Price, Director of the Stanford Executive Program, and I'll be your moderator. Today we're pleased to be in the classroom with Professor Bill Barnett. Bill is the Thomas M. Siebel Professor of Business Leadership, Strategy, and Organizations. He's also the Faculty Director of the Stanford Executive Program, which we commonly refer to as SEP. Today you've joined us for a webinar, and we would like to share other ways you can engage with us to stay informed on the latest developments from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. We are charged with the mission of changing lives, changing organizations, and changing the world. We believe we deliver on this mission through the education and development of leaders, leaders like you. Our portfolio of residential and online educational programs help influential and dedicated leaders to discover new perspectives, mindsets, and frameworks that will help them drive impact and inspire innovation. While it's hard to describe our portfolio of programs succinctly, innovative and inspiring quickly come to mind. Innovative, you're at the heart of Silicon Valley. You're at the forefront of cutting-edge faculty research that's shaping the future of modern leadership and business. Inspiring. You're exposed to new ideas, people, and ways of thinking. You return to work with a plan and the tools to make an impact. To share one example from our portfolio, Professor Barnett and I worked together on our flagship executive education program, the Stanford Executive Program, or SEP. SEP is a six-week general management program that immerses you in Stanford's unique culture of collaboration and creativity. The SEP curriculum is designed to strengthen your business fundamentals and help you discover agile, thoughtful solutions to the challenges and opportunities faced by today's leaders. From design thinking and big data to negotiation, financial engineering, and strategic management, you experience the very best the Stanford GSB has to offer, concentrated and customized to meet the needs and know-how of experienced leaders. The diverse and dynamic global leaders in each cohort add richness and depth to your experience. We carefully curate each class, selecting participants from diverse industries and unique experiences, because we believe that's the only way true innovation happens. We hope this webinar with Professor Barnett gives you a taste of the learning available here at Stanford. We want to hear from you. Please submit your questions. We'll answer as many as possible either live or offline via email. Thank you, Bill, for being here with us today. Well, thank you very much, Ryan. And thank you for coming to the webinar today. We'll talk for a few minutes together about competition and leadership. And as Ryan said, we'd love to hear questions from you. Some people have already sent in questions, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. So I say competition and leadership, and a lot of different things come to mind. Let me first say uh, competition is innate in the human experience. I remember years ago when uh, one of my sons, who's uh, now a full-blown adult, was just a kid, a, a little guy, must have been five or six years old, and we had in, in town one of those soccer leagues where everybody's always supposed to be happy during the game and uh, because they're five and six years old. So the idea is just let's go out there and kick the ball around. And, uh, and of course, there are just as many adults as kids, and so there's, you know, it's, it's quite a theatrical event. And um, some of the kids, even at five or six years old, understood that in the game of soccer, as we call it in America, the, the object of the game is to kick the ball into a goal. And we had little goals set up, and the kids had little shirts on and so forth. And it's a smaller field than normal, beautiful California day. Uh, but we didn't want the kids to be keeping score and, and tracking who was ahead or who was behind because of the fact that 
they're just little kids and we wanted to make sure that they uh, didn't get overly competitive. Um, and so we're telling them the score doesn't matter and uh, some of the kids had no clue what was going on anyway so it wouldn't have mattered if we were keeping score but some of the kids including my son James and his buddy Jenner uh, were hankering to actually play a sport. It was sort of, uh, they were a little frustrated by it. And after a couple of Saturdays, on the third Saturday, I remember uh, my buddy Pete, who was Jenner's, who's Jenner's dad, uh, and I, were, we were the coaches, and so we noticed that Jenner and James were off at the side and they had smuggled in paper and crayons. Now, they were only five or six, so they weren't really, uh, they didn't have a lot of uh, uh, ability to read and write and so forth, but, but they knew how to keep score. So they were over there and they had drawn up a score pad and then every time one of the other side, they would keep score. And it was the honest score if they were losing, but they just wanted to know. And I can remember now, you know, going over and saying to Pete, well, do we, do we take this away? I mean, this league says we're not supposed to keep score, but they're keeping score. And we didn't have the heart to take it away from them. And, and you know, it's, at some level, it's built in. Now, some of you right away may be saying, now, hang on, Barnett, it's cultural. Well, it turns out, and there's a lot of literature on this, uh, that competition happens in all human societies its expression, what we consider to be the appropriate way to play out competitions, that's what is cultural. So there are some cultural contexts that would uh, uh, shape competition differently in different uh, places. If you've worked in organizations in different parts of the world, you've experienced this where some kinds of competitions are okay to have in some places and other kinds in other places. And, and so I, right away I want to say if you're thinking it's not innate, it is. But its expression is what is culturally shaped. And, and, and this is uh, what I think makes paying attention to competition as a leader so important. Because our organizations and our organization cultures are also part of what shapes the way competition is expressed. Um, and I, I also, I begin by talking about competition as something that's innate because I want to point out, I want to begin with the observation that competition is happening all the time among humans even when they have not designed a situation to facilitate competition. It's happening constantly. Our uh, psychology colleagues talk about social comparison theory, an idea that goes way back to the 1950s and the, the work of uh, Festinger and so forth. And, and uh, no doubt you've been exposed to some understanding of social comparison theory. Social comparison theory refers to this tendency that humans have when, whenever we face uncertainty is to look around at others to find out where you stand compared to others, just to understand what's considered appropriate and what's considered not appropriate in uh, terms of levels of, 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 of excellence or behavior, that's where competition uh, comes in. Think about some time in your life when you got a grade back on an exam back in the old school days. Well, the very first thing you do is find out what the other people around you got on their tests because you want to know where you stand. And as a longtime professor, I can tell you, you never just give people their grades. You give people their grades and then you tell them the distribution. People have to know where they stand. And you know the fact that that's a relative group, that maybe that's not even the right group to compare to, that doesn't matter. I just want to know where I stand. Um, uh, it's, it's happening all the time. It's around us. It shapes the decisions we make. Yeah, I remember when I was a young professor, I have been at Stanford for a long time. And back when I was, it was 1991, so I was in my young, early 30s, I used to work out on campus. I don't do that anymore. I probably could do that now because we have a lot of gymnasiums and all sorts of facilities. But back then, we just had one gym. So if you wanted to work out, you went to this particular gym. And I will still, I, I still, it is seared on my mind the day that I was taking a shower when the entire varsity football team of Stanford University came in and joined me. 
And that was not good for my self-esteem. Now look, nobody's comparing me to the Sanford football team. It's not like I have to worry about that. I just didn't want to be in the shower with the Stanford football team again. So now I go off to the YMCA in Palo Alto where I can knock the other old guy off a machine and be the big guy, right? And it's, you know, it's, it, why should it matter? Well, because I'm a human. So it's constantly happening. It's not like you want to have a competition. I'm saying this because if you were tonight to sit down with uh, someone and have a conversation, you go home and you have a partner or a spouse, friend, and you're having a, something to drink and you, and you get in a conversation and you say that there was something, com was there something competitive going on? A lot of people say, oh, no, 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 our organization isn't competitive. Hold on. Competition is endemic. It is innate. It's there among all humans. Now, what they could be referring to is that their leaders have created a context that limits the expression of that competition and perhaps channels it in constructive ways. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. But the potential for con competition, the understanding that social comparison is part of human existence, that goes on whenever there are people. That's always uh, that's always going on. And therefore, it is very important for you as a leader. Now, that's not, now, of course, folks tuned into this webinar are at different levels in their career. Some of you are quite advanced. Some of you are uh, just emerging as a, as a leader. Others, perhaps you haven't yet moved into leadership positions, but you think about that, and it's the kind of thing that uh, you understand could well be there in your future. Competition happens at the level of small groups, at the level of uh, whole departments, of whole organizations, of industries and economies. So it's happening everywhere. So truly anyone in a leadership position has to be aware that competitive forces are operating. We have a question from Pedro, and he's asking, when you're talking about competition, is it always between humans, or could you be competing with something that's not another person? Mm, yeah. Well, that's interesting. So, um, yeah, clearly, competition among humans is where I went with my different stories, and and I often, when I'm trying to illustrate things, will tell stories at the level of people, uh, but very much so, we understand that competition takes place also among. Uh, groupings, really almost arbitrary groupings. There are some famous uh, uh, experiments, uh, in fact, they carried out here at Stanford University some years ago, uh, where simply dividing people into groupings according to the color of their eyes made everyone involved in the experiment treat uh, some people as out-group and some people as in-group simply based on something so arbitrary as the color of their eyes. Um, and these were people who were well aware that they were all students, they were well aware that they were all part of an experiment, and yet suddenly their, their behavior changed. Uh, and so you see the competition, is, it, it's not just among people, but it's among the social construct of the group. And of course we see this in our organizations all the time. Once people know that someone is from one department versus another, one group versus another, then the possibility of intergroup uh, competition uh, kicks in at that point. Um, and Pedro, it's a great question, and we will return to it. It'll come up in a, in a few minutes. We're going to move to talking about competition among organizations, and at that point, we'll return to your question. But thanks for that, uh, Ryan. And. Uh, so as leaders, if we're going to think about how to lead with competition in mind, uh, there are some very specific recommendations that I will give you based on uh, the research. Uh, but I'd like to explain those recommendations by first getting us to think through the underlying mechanisms that are at work when competition is going on. There are basically two underlying mechanisms. One. I refer to as measuring up. So when you compete, it gives you that sense, like I said, about the time when you were in school and you wanted to know whether missing uh, five points on the test was good or bad. You look to others because you wanted to know if you were measuring up. And so in that sense, 
even if there isn't an actual competition taking place in the sense of a formalized tournament, simply knowing how others are doing helps you to understand where you measure up. And so measuring up is one way that, that competition is happening around us all the time. It doesn't mean you want it to happen. Uh, it, it sometimes just happens. I, I remember uh, having breakfast one morning and you'll have to forgive me for all the stories about kids, but my wife and I have a, a lot of kids, so that that's often my experiences. And so, but I remember one morning, you know, we're getting breakfast, and my youngest daughter, uh, Lillian, she was pretty young at that point, but she was aware of, of things going on around by then in terms of awards and so forth. And, you know, on the radio, they announced the Nobel Prize winners during a certain season of the of the year and they announced, you know, a Nobel Prize going to uh, one, one of my colleagues here in yeah, Stanford and, and Lillian perked up and said, hey, dad, you know, so-and-so won the Nobel Prize. And this is long pause and I could just see it coming. She said, you know, dad, isn't that the, I don't remember how many, there have been a lot of Stanford Prizes that year, it was like the fifth prize this year, whatever number. So, uh, at, at, and she looked at me and I could see what was coming. She said, Dad, are you going to win the Nobel Prize? Now, I don't know if you have ever been asked that question. But, you know, at that point, I feel like, you know, no, I'm a failure, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of the, the, there are jobs I could have had where I wouldn't be asked that question. But once upon a time, I got a job at this institution, and now these people are running around. You know, at Berkeley, if you want to get a good parking spot, one way to do it is you win the Nobel Prize, and then you get the NL parking sticker, which is the highly valued. So whenever I go to Berkeley, I park in an NL spot, because that's about as close as I'm ever going to come. And, you know, am I measuring up? I don't know. I mean, you could put yourself in a different uh, context, and you'd feel like you are measuring up. But it's that first mechanism. It's not like you want to be in these contests, but they're all around us. We're constantly asking uh, whether, you're, whether you're measuring up. Uh, you know, you, you probably experienced it over the weekend. You and your, your partner or, or spouse, uh, significant other, were at a party, and then somebody comes in who looks like a movie star. And then suddenly everyone else is uncomfortable. Well, it's not like you're in a competition, for in a, in a beauty competition, but the fact is there you are standing next to Brad Pitt and it just is going to have an effect on you. And so you think about social comparison, the measuring up aspect is constantly there. Um, and the second way, the second mechanism is scarcity. Because of scarcity, Competition is understood to exist even when we're not making a social comparison. And so think about it that way. The last time you were in a meeting and you were seen as a representative from, a representative from your function, maybe coming out of marketing or coming out of strategy or finance or operations, whatever, and somebody else is there from another department. And there's a question about a budgetary allocation. Should it go to your department or should it go to their department? Right away you're realizing, well, my goal is to get that allocation. And my argument will be to say all the reasons why my department should get that allocation. But you notice you, you should actually have done it the other way around. If what we cared about was the organization, we would say, well, let's talk about where this allocation should go for the good of the organization. And then after we've moved through the logic, we might conclude that, in fact, the other person's department ought to get that allocation. As much as we wish that's the way things would go, the understanding that there's scarcity will typically lead people to say, well, first of all, let me accumulate resources for my department. And in fact, for many people, when they take a position of leadership, being the rainmaker for their department or group or function or their part of the organization is often seen as what their primary responsibility is that they should be bringing in resources so that the, uh, the rest of the men and women in the uh, organization, in that part of the organization, can get their job done. If you're not bringing in resources, you're not doing, doing your job. Well, bringing in resources means winning in competitions over scarce resources. And so it's both measuring up, making that comparison, but also 
getting a hold of resources in a world of zero-sum trade-offs, where what you get, I don't get. Those are the two mechanisms that make it so competition is going on all the time. Now, you know, the reason I bring up these two mechanisms is that the consequences of competition are best understood once you recognize that these mechanisms are going on. And let's face it, sometimes those competitions are, or those uh, consequences of competition are great. Uh, when it comes to measuring up, you want to know where you stand so that you know if you have to pick up your game. And uh, also to know whether or not that's a game you even think you ought to be playing. I remember as a kid thinking that I'd be a baseball player. Fortunately, there were contexts where I could go be compared to others so that I didn't waste much more time going in that direction uh, than because that was not to be. That was not really an area where, where I was going to measure up. And so that's the good side of competition. We find out who it is who, who should be moving in a particular direction and doing a certain thing. We know how to evaluate the quality of what we do. And when we lack the ability to, to, to measure up, we often get dysfunctional consequences. So you do want to have competitions. I remember I used, to, I used to get fried chicken from a Chinese takeout on the Canterbury Road in Folkestone, England, right across the road from the Black Bull Inn uh, at a Chinese takeout run by some Indian people who were actually a post office. Now, as you can imagine, that probably wasn't the best fried chicken you were ever going to get. They called it Maryland fried chicken. I am not sure why they it had bananas thrown in the batter, too. It was disgusting, as I think back on it. But there was no, they weren't involved in much of a competition. You can go to parts of the United States where competitions, and uh, Seoul, Korea for that matter, where competitions over making good fried chicken are fierce. And the survivors of those competitions are amazing organizations. This one wasn't one of them. So you do want to have the measuring up. The measuring up allows you to sort out quality. However, because measuring up is everywhere, it can often be counterproductive. You can often be in situations with people where the need to measure up creates a tremendous amount of stress, where the human consequences of constantly being evaluated are actually bad for people in terms of their, their health. Uh, our colleagues in, uh, uh, in the sciences and in uh, psychology have documented this. Um, and where many of their behaviors turn out to be counterproductive, in particular the tendency to be risk averse. If you know you're going to be measured up against the performance of others, will you risk ever failing? What if you take a course of action that might have big possible returns for your organization, but if it doesn't go well, might cause a failure? Will you be reluctant to do that? Well, that may depend on how much pressure there is to measure up. So we have to be aware of the fact, though, though we would love it if competition always had positive consequences, it often has very negative consequences, both for the human condition and for be the behavior of humans who live in fear of seeming to be a failure. Um, and also with respect to scarcity, and zero-sum trade-offs, uh, once again, that can have a good consequence in the sense that it makes people uh, do their best to justify having resources. We don't want to be budgeting resources without people making a good argument. But on the other hand, many of the maladies that we see in organizational life where people are working for their own good individually or the good of their group and not the good of the organization come from the fact that there's scarcity. We would wish people would think what is the, the uh, kind of budgetary allocation that would be best for the organization. But unfortunately, knowing there's scarcity, people become much more acquisitive in organizations and that's also a set of maladies. And because of those maladies, leaders are confronted with the following situation at work. Okay, now, and listen carefully to what I'm about to say. Number one, competition is endemic and it's innate in our lives at work, so we know it's going to be there. And then number two, although it 
often has good consequences. We know it often has incredibly counterproductive consequences, both for human health, for human health and for our behavior in organizations where we're either risk averse or we're trying to amass resources, uh, even when that's not good for the organization. We have a number of questions coming in around the idea between competition and collaboration and mm -hmm. could you even compete to be good collaborators? Mm -hmm. And how do you think about those two attributes as a leader on a team? Yeah, that's a great point. You know, um, almost always you will hear people, academics especially, uh, but people in general in consultancies and so forth, talk about cooperation and uh, competition almost as if they were um, uh, opposing or polar opposites. So I love this question, uh, Ryan, because um, it's much subtler than that. The way that we really see competition and, and cooperation or collaboration happening in organizations is that, uh, is, is in a sense, we, by working together, are cooperating, which implies that we're pooling our efforts in the same direction and trying to be supportive of one another, which you would not think of as, as uh, a competition. Um, uh, but we often pool our efforts in order to compete. In other words, in order to do better and end up competing. And while I, I try to refrain from too many sports references because many of you may not be sports fans, um, uh, please bear with me because sports is the one place that really does illustrate this phenomenon uh, sort of more effectively than any other. Obviously, sports can be very competitive. It's the whole nature of sports that they're set up to theatrically demonstrate a winner and a loser. Um, but of course, team sports will typically have a set of fierce competitors who are working together. And uh, it is almost by definition a great leader who knows to align the efforts of these fierce competitors so they're not against one another but for one another in the same direction. And it's up to the leader to make sure that those same behaviors and passions that power the athlete to want to compete with another team are not turned against uh, her teammates. If she turns them against her teammates, then you end up with a lot of the counterproductive competition within the team. And that's already built in. If you're the very best uh, player of a certain type, by your very nature, you will probably be getting more playing time and the other one won't. So the, the good coaches are not trying to orchestrate more competition within the team. They're, in fact, trying to mitigate against it, uh, Ryan. So I, I love that. Uh, I love that. And in fact, it leads me to the first of my conclusions that you should take away. And so for those of you who've been waiting for the takeaways, perk up. Here they are. Number one, don't create competitions at work. So many times, well-meaning people in leadership positions will create increasing incentives to compete or increasing, uh, basically they'll orchestrate competitions at all levels in terms of performance evaluations that are explicitly competitive uh, or in terms of other kinds of um, uh, competitions. Look, competition already exists in your organization. If you turn up the heat and have even more competition than what is naturally occurring, you can easily, almost predictably, spill over into having the maladaptive problems that can come from too much competition. And then secondly, create a culture in your organization that works against the negative implications of competition. So for example, we talked about in the face of uh, scarcity uh, or measuring up of worrying about uh, uh, making a mistake and so therefore being risk averse. But you do need people to take the risk of trying new things at times and talking about ideas that aren't fully proven. Well, in order to have that kind of behavior in a competitive world, you'll want to create a culture that encourages uh, taking risks that are appropriate for your organization 
even though those might end up in negative consequences. And so as a leader, you're going in and trying to work against the natural tendency to be risk averse that we see uh, coming out of the fact that competitions for measuring up are constantly going on uh, around us. Or once again, if we think about creating a culture where the norms are to care about the organization when it comes to resource allocation rather than my group. Um, and it can be very difficult to do that. You can look at a cross-functional team in one organization that performs very badly because of the infighting and that same cross-functional team in an organization that has a culture that works towards the betterment, the, the collective understanding that we're working for the betterment of the whole organization is going to have, have less of that infighting. Mm -hmm. So don't create competition, do create a culture uh, that mitigates against the bad sides of competition. So what I'd like to do now, um, so I know for some of you who know the research I've done, you may be surprised at what we've just talked about. Uh, because I have spent much of my career do doing work on the benefits of competitions among organizations, so-called Red Queen competition where organizations competing with one another make uh, the uh, level of uh, excellence and quality in an industry increase and therefore they themselves become more competitive. Um, and so to have me uh, now come forward and, and speak for a full half hour on all the reasons that competition inside organizations is something that as a leader you want to attenuate and, uh, and, and guard against the negative consequences of may be surprising to many of you. Um, and so now let's turn to that question. What about competition among organizations, among companies, um, among not-for-profits in parts of the, in the world? Those kinds of competitions, they happen as well. What I think is so interesting about competition among organizations is that we have the field of strategy. The field of strategy, going way back to the earliest days of competitor analysis in the 1980s, was a field based on the, uh, the single idea that organizations should avoid competing. If you think about it, those of you who have had strategy classes, the very first thing that you learn is that you want to avoid competitors, you want to make sure no rivals are going to enter, you want to make sure if you have buyers that they're weak. You want to make sure if you have suppliers that they're weak. And you want to make sure there are no substitutes for what you do. In the world of strategy, you will have succeeded when you were alone. A world where there's no competition to worry about. Well, much of my early career's work was documenting that that idea that competition is bad for organizations is false. Well, sure, in a world where you could be a monopolist today and will forever be a monopolist, there's an argument to be made for staying a monopolist because you'll never face any competition. But in a world where new competition is always just around the corner, it turns out that competition disciplines, competition teaches. Organizations that have competed tend to compete even better going into the future. I remember when Reed Hastings was just starting Netflix and um, at that time I was uh, directing uh, our strategy executive program, one of the various programs that Ryan uh, referred to that we have here at Stanford uh, for helping executives improve their leadership uh, um, uh, skills and outlook. And, um, we happened to have several participants in that program from a video rental company called Blockbuster. And we all were sitting together one evening at the dinner when all the executives are kind of talking about the different ideas and it's just a wonderful conversation environment. And I mentioned what, what at that time Netflix was doing and of course now we know what's happened but at that time Netflix was a risky move. They were mailing DVDs. It was not obvious that they were a, a, going to be a winner. Um, and uh, 
but what was especially interesting is that neither Netflix nor Blockbuster uh, thought that in a head-to-head -head competition that Netflix uh, would end up uh, doing better. Now, it turns out that the approach that Netflix took, as we all know, was uh, evolved to be much more competitive than the brick-and-mortar approach. Our understanding of the world at that time was that you needed brick and mortar to have immediate access to uh, Snow White or, or Cinderella in order to get those home to the kids type of thing or whatever movie you wanted to watch. Um, they were making most of their money on late fees at the time, so you would drive down the street and every time you saw the blockbuster you would feel guilty because you'd remember that Cinderella's under the bed at home and you got to get her back before you can have Snow. So no kids, there's no Snow White because we got to find Cinderella first. And, and then every time you go in, you'd have to pay large amounts of money and late fees. And never mind the fact that none of that would happen with Netflix. It was only by directly competing that we learned a very different logic and would end up preferring that one to the other one. And that competition would vastly improve that industry. For another example, if you have an iPhone, you should be thankful that the Android ecosystem exists. And if you have one of the Android phones, a Google phone or a Samsung or, or what have you, you should be thankful that the Apple iOS ecosystem exists because each of those disciplines the other. If your phone can't navigate a map, the pressure from the competition from the other side will force them at some point to figure that out and so forth. And in all these ways, competition among organizations is what leads to that dynamic of ever improving performance. We often call it red queen competition because there's a reference in biological evolutionary theory made by uh, the great uh, uh, now deceased biologist Van Valen back in 1973, uh, who noticed that biological evolution also had this quality. And he called it red queen competition. Uh, the references to Lewis Carroll through the looking glass where Alice is having this dream and the queen says, the red queen, the playing card queen says to, to Alice uh, something and then Alice says, but I'm, you know, I'm running as fast as I can, but I am not moving. And the red queen says, well, you must be from a slow world because here we run just to stand still. And that's, that's how it is in organizational life. Organizations are improving all the time, but so are their rivals. And so they're feeling like they're never ending up the monopolist. They never find that, that much talked about blue ocean where they can uh, uh, be alone. Uh, but that's because those things don't exist. Where there's a place to make money, there are going to be rivals. And those rivals are actually good for disciplining the organization. Now I've made that argument among organizations, but I've made that argument because organizations aren't people. We discipline organizations. If you don't discipline organizations, they survive despite the fact that they're peddling Maryland Fried Chicken right across from the Black Bull Inn on the Folkestone Road, on the Canterbury Road in Folkestone at a Chinese takeout run by Indians at the, their post office. That shouldn't exist. It only exists because of the lack of competition. So every time you see an inefficiency in organizational life, you should ask, did somebody take some kind of a strategy class where they learned they should never compete? Because that's leading their organization to be put in a context where it's underperforming. I, I still uh, am, uh, stand in awe of the story of POSCO, the great Korean steel company. Now today, those of you who know the steel industry know that POSCO is a tremendous innovator. But back after the uh, uh, Korean War, when POSCO was first being created in South Korea, that country had a labor advantage that told everyone that if they were going to make steel, they should do it in a labor-intensive way because they had a labor advantage. And that if they made steel with the most modern technologies, they would be up against the great uh, German steel makers, the great American steel makers, the, uh, et cetera. Instead, the leadership of POSCO in Korea, backed by um, the government uh, leaders in Korea, bravely 
chose to move into the highest technology levels of production at POSCO. They did that precisely because they wanted to engage the competition in order to raise the standards of excellence among Korean companies. It's no accident that that relatively tiny country has been one of the miracle economies because they have had the courage in their leadership to subject their organizations to competition. But organizations aren't people. So the maladies we talk about within organizations, among people who compete, of stress, of counterproductive behaviors, that's very different at the industrial level. So look where we stand. We, typically, we teach our leaders to increase competition inside organizations, but not to compete outside, and I am arguing for the very opposite approach. When it comes to your organization, go out and compete. That's where the competition should be happening. But inside your organization, facilitate collaboration. Mitigate against the maladies of too much competition because your people have inherent human pressures to compare themselves to one another, to grapple over scarce resources. And one of your primary responsibilities as a leader is to put in place a context where the counterproductive consequences of competition are less common. Now look, I want to open it up to more questions, but, uh, but before uh, I do, I'm, I feel compelled as the director of the Stanford Executive Program to put a plug in. But please, don't sign out, okay, because you were, you were figuring at some point Barnett would go into his pitch. I'm not saying you should come to Stanford. But I am saying you should pay attention to the role of the leader, that you should take the role of the leader seriously. And of course you're thinking, but of course, no, no, no. Why did you get promoted? Why do we promote people into their leadership positions? Typically because they did something in a job that they will stop doing after they become a leader. I was speaking with someone who works at a pharmaceutical company uh, just last week uh, here on campus uh, and she had been promoted into a leadership position and was now here studying at Stanford uh, leadership skills in executive education but she's a scientist she made her chops doing great science and stood out as a scientist so they promoted her well the trouble is as a leader in, the, in this particular pharmaceutical company, her, she's no longer on the bench, as, a, as the scientists put it. So she's not there doing the, the genetics and, and with, the, with the white coat on. She's now going to meetings and talking about budgetary allocations and working across functional teams and making sure that legal compliance and regulatory affairs is up on the latest developments in their innovations and that their uh, new innovations are getting patented and all those things that leaders care about. Those weren't things that she learned about back when she was getting her PhD and becoming a scientist. And for every one of you, you have a story. And your story probably featured doing something reasonably well, perhaps very well. And often that story does not include a training in understanding the tools you need as a leader. So you need to invest in that. And yes, here at Stanford, we do have programs for you. There are other ways you can invest in those as well. Uh, but don't neglect your education as a leader. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, you Ryan. You're welcome. We have a number of questions. Um, so one of the questions we're getting a lot in different angles is the relationship between competition and diversity. Mm. And that's more looking inside the organization, which you were talking about being a place to lessen competition. But I had wondered if you wanted to speak to diversity and competition. Yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Ryan. And, and you know, the, uh, I think the reason that the, uh, the call for diversity in organizational life is so important is that we want to make sure we're clear about the criteria that are used 
for advancing people in their careers. You know, if you, if you think about it, uh, in, a, in a world where traditional patterns, um, which in, in the United States would mean uh, the hiring and promoting of white men, for example, but where traditional patterns maintain themselves, uh, we end up in a situation where we're not allowing large parts of the workforce the opportunity uh, to go ahead and show that they're as capable or even more capable than anyone else at the things that they want to do. Now we've seen that changing so much across the world that it, it gladdens my heart. As an old guy, I've seen quite a bit of change uh, over the decades. And, um, and each time you see the call for greater diversity having success, you see more people being given a chance to be rewarded on the basis of merit, uh, regardless of the superficial things about them, like their sex uh, or their race uh, or their religion or their national origin and so forth. Um, it, one of the things I love about uh, being at Stanford as a, as a professor and, and teaching over the years has, is, has been to see the increasing diversity among our undergraduates, among our graduate students, and among our faculty. Uh, and so when I look on the walls where they'll have, you know, pictures of the old faculty, it's a very homogeneous group because it dates back to an era where uh, uh, there was less diversity in terms of access to these opportunities. And I'm not trying to make it, you know, please don't misunderstand me, I'm not trying to say all the problems in the world have been solved with respect to equal opportunity. They have not. They absolutely have not. But that's what makes this such an important question. So I'm so glad it's come up. Uh, here at Stanford, as, uh, as is the case, I think, for uh, most of the great educational institutions of the world, we care to get the very best. And if we get the very best, they will look different from one another. And so uh, if you have had uh, a life that has taken you through avenues that are uh, uh, non-traditional um, and uh, you're wondering, maybe you're concerned that you might not fit in very well in Stanford Executive Education, that means you'll fit in great because we do everything we can to look for the most innovative, the most creative uh, participants in our executive education. We do have selective educa uh, executive education programs, especially SEP. Um, but we select on the basis of the innovativeness and uh, experience that a person brings to the table. And because of that, we have a very diverse uh, 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 group. It's, it makes you, um, uh, it's amazing when you're teaching and you see people who are from every continent. I, uh, often over half of the people in the room will be from outside of the United States. You, you see women, you see uh, men, you see all different races, you see different religions, people dressed sometimes in very uh, traditional ways, people dressed in uh, Western ways, you see people of different sexual orientations, and you see us all commonly trying to understand how organizations can function better, how the world can be made uh, to be a better place, and it's incredibly inspiring. So I, I, I just have to say, you know, we talk about competition. Diver to me, allowing for diversity and making sure competition has healthy consequences are are exactly uh, they are they are two sides of the of the same coin. I remember writing a paper back in the '90s where. Uh, 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 my co-author, uh, Ann Miner, a wonderful professor at the University of Wisconsin, and I uh, wrote this paper on competitions inside organizations and noted that if you, uh, if you hire uh, um, a, a more diverse workforce, but you don't promote allowing for diversity, then you really lead to some terrible counterproductive 
consequences, that what you really want to do is allow for diversity both in hiring and in promotion so that merit is the criterion that is used for advancement. And that leads by its very nature to a more diverse uh, leadership team and a, and, a, and a more diverse organization throughout. Thank you. You bet. We have another question around kind of this issue of competition, but one of the things I'm noticing in the questions and that you've said is there's also this factor of accountability. Mm. So when you're looking internally and you're thinking about merit, accountability is a way to demonstrate how someone has obtained a level of, of merit or not. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. could you speak to how internally without competition you would drive an organization to move away from meritocracy or uh, infighting, et cetera? Yes, yes. So yeah, that's a great question. So of course accountability is important for we need to be able to make sure that we're accountable, not only that our behaviors are appropriate uh, in terms of uh, who's responsible for a decision, um, uh, but also in terms of resource allocation. So we have to make sure that our resource allocations in organizations are justified. And uh, much of organizational life, as we all know, is spent laying out justifications for why we spend money here and not there, or why we made this decision and not that decision. And often, these, um, the, uh, the uh, drive to assure accountability goes on as part of a, a post-mortem, if you will. That if you haven't heard that expression, sometimes we'll use it in organizations to talk about sort of after there's been an attempt to do something, maybe a new project or a, a, a new initiative of some kind. Um, if it goes well, but especially if it doesn't go well, we'll often say, let's do a post-mortem. And that's really sort of looking back on what happened and trying to account for uh, uh, what decisions were made and how could we do better the next time. So when a post-mortem and accountability are being uh, uh, assured in a way that is good for an organization, what we're doing is taking what we've done, learning from it, so that the next time around we'll do a better job. Now, Unfortunately, one of the things that often happens is that the drive to assure accountability leads people, if they're concerned, that they might end up suffering unfairly from some future post-mortem. It leads people to be risk averse, to, uh, to try to cover their bases, to make sure that they aren't going to be held accountable for something that maybe they couldn't control. And of course, this is you know much the, the the stuff of comedy about organizational life of people who spend more time making sure they're not going to be blamed for things uh, than they do actually trying to get the job done. And so, it, and this is in, in fact exactly one of these counterproductive consequences of competition. If you turn up the competitive heat in organizations, you don't get fiercer competitors you get a lot more covering of the rear end as people are trying to make sure that they're going to be safe um, against uh, any kind of, of, of possible uh, repercussions from some future post-mortem. So what you would rather have, precisely by turning down the dial on the intensity of competition, it makes our drive to, um, for accountability and to do post-mortems much healthier. Because now people see it as, well, you know, we didn't do well at something. Let's learn from that, understanding that if part of that learning shows that perhaps decisions they made weren't the best decisions and they would do it differently next time, that that's not going to damage their careers. And this has to go past words, by the way. Uh, this goes into the domain of action because people are not stupid and they know uh, when you're not walking the talk. So if you, if you want to make a healthy context for people to take risks at an appropriate level, you have to make sure that people are accountable, but you have to do so in a way where they're not unduly suffering from competitive comparisons with others. And by the way, I should add, the, the, the research literature that I'm drawing on here is, is really vast. This is an area that has been studied by social psychologists, by organizational behavior experts, uh, by behavioral economists. 
really a, across a wide range of different disciplines you, you draw on to, to reach these conclusions uh, that I'm reaching. And not everyone would agree with me. There are um, some scholars and there are certainly some organizations that really want to double down on competition. But I think uh, the arguments I'm making are based on a good understanding uh, that competition is endemic in life and that, and that therefore the job of the leader is to create a context where those competitions uh, are less counterproductive. Now, there's a, I'd like to just say one final thing, Ryan, if you wouldn't mind, and then I'm going to turn it back over to you. As you develop as a leader, if there was one thing I would want you to do is to see your job not as to be the person who knows what needs to be done. You need to see your job as the person who creates the context within which others can be all that they can be. You create a context when you're a leader. Inside your organization, create a context where the forces of competition, which of course will be there, manifest in positive outcomes, both for the health of your individual employees, but also for the performance of your organization. And I wish you all the best with that.